As we've been discussing on today's program, a Texas woman has been arrested after allegedly threatening the judge overseeing the special counsel's 2020 election interference case against Donald Trump. But the threat against Judge Tanya Chutkin does not exist in a vacuum or in isolation. It follows and is part of a frightening pattern in recent years of growing vitriolic threats being made against lawmakers, federal officials, media figures, judges, anyone who right-wing extremists perceive as a threat to Donald Trump. Just yesterday, we learned that members of a pro-Trump extremist forum posted the names and addresses of the Fulton County Grand Jurors who returned a criminal indictment against the ex-president and 18 co-defendants. It's a practice known as doxing. Last week, a Utah man named Craig Robertson was shot and killed during an attempted arrest by the FBI after Robertson allegedly made violent threats against President Joe Biden ahead of his visit to the state. According to NPR, quote, while threats may target a bipartisan array of public officials, data from the last decade shows that 96 percent of murders in the U.S. linked to political extremism are committed by right-wing actors, end quote. Former member of the January 6th Select Committee, Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff joins us now. He's also a candidate for U.S. Senate in California. Um, Congressman, I feel like you're one of those people who's been warning us the longest and the loudest. Um, what do you make of this moment we find ourselves in? Well, there is a dangerous increase in acceptance of the idea of political violence. Uh, we have seen this, I think, throughout the Trump presidency and the post-presidency. Uh, I don't think you could find a member of the January 6th committee that has had multiple threats. There have been multiple people prosecuted uh, for threatening to kill me. Uh, it has become all too common. Uh, and more than members of Congress and more than those that have been involved uh, in these issues, school board members are being threatened. City council members are being threatened. Uh, I remember speaking to a, city, a school board member some months ago who said she wasn't running again because she had a young family and she didn't want to put up with these death threats. Why would she want to do that? And uh, the, the problem, I think, writ large, is when you attack uh, our elections, uh, when you say that the only way you lose uh, is if it's rigged somehow, uh, if you can discredit our institutions to that degree, uh, if you can attack the truth and fact uh, sufficiently, then, then what is left to decide what our policies should be, who should govern, uh, if we can't even agree on a basic set of facts, then what is left but violence to decide? And this is a hazardous path. Our country's never been down. Uh, we need to stop the country from moving any further in this direction. Uh, I'm afraid that probably won't happen until Donald Trump is once again defeated at the polls. But it is a very disturbing trend. What's interesting to me, I mean, you're not the variable, right? I mean, I, I guess I'm old enough and have been in politics long enough to remember, the, you know, you're viewed as a, as a policy expert, a national security expert, viewed as a reasonable figure by Democrats and Republicans in a pre-Trump era. Now you're one of Trump's public enemies, you know, top 10, I guess. Uh, now that he's got a Republican primary, maybe you're in the second tier, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> what do you think it is, right? So you're not the variable, the media, you know, what, what is the variable? What makes Trump supporters uniquely comfortable and accepting of political violence? Uh, you know, I think it's a couple of things. I think that, you know, for the first time, we have a major party leader uh, who condones violence, uh, you know, not always directly, but, but you know, very thinly veiled. Uh, those who come after me, we're going after you. Uh, a lot of the rhetoric he uses in his social media posts at his rallies uh, is, you know, very encouraging of this kind of attitude that violence is somehow condoned or okay or consistent with who he is. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I think what has contributed to the sort of intense polarization is just the fact we don't get our information from the same places anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, social media has really magnified the extremes uh, and in particular has uh, allowed people who are prone to violence to find each other online and given them an organizing tool. Uh, and, and so I think it's changes in how we get our information, but also a party leader who has been a uniquely divisive figure and willing to sort of break all of the boundaries, all of the norms that have guided our democracy until now.
You know, I, I think some of it, too, is we've, we've covered the collapse of the Republican Party. I've, I've talked about this here as a, as a political story. And when you look at what's been ushered in, this acceptance of political violence, a preference for Russian leaders as opposed to American leaders who happen to be registered Democrats, um, it, it, it is a story also of a party that now represents a threat to our national security, a threat to our ability to stand by democracies fighting American adversaries. How do you, how do you, is, can that be undone? How do you unring those bells? I think it can be undone. And I think you're right. I, I realized uh, in the first year of the Trump administration, something that I never thought I would contemplate, which is that the predominant threat to our democracy now came from within that there was nothing Russia or China or North Korea could do to divide us, to uh, tear down our institutions more than, the, than our own president of the United States had been doing. Uh, but what made that possible was the enablement of so many Republican members of Congress who went along with it. Uh, you know, just within the last uh, 24 to 48 hours, we saw Kevin McCarthy once again excuse, rationalize, uh, Donald Trump's conduct vilify uh, yet another prosecutor for trying to hold him accountable, suggests that this was all political instead of it, what, what it is, which is justice and accountability. When, when someone who holds the office of speaker uh, tears down our institutions that way, it is what has brought us to such a fragile point. Uh, you know, it, it just, uh, I, I think, has revealed who so many people in office really are. Uh, what they stand for, what they truly believe in. And for all too many, it's it's the pursuit of power, the holding of power, the democracy be damned if necessary. Uh, it's that kind of ethic that has made things so fragile. Now, I, I believe that if the, Donald Trump is the nominee and if he loses again, as I believe he will, that the Republican Party just may decide it's finally time to part company. Uh, it's time to have a party of ideology again, a party in which... Someone like Liz Cheney or Adam Kinzer can have a home. Uh, they won't do it necessarily for the sake of the country, it appears, but they just may do it for the sake of their party. Uh, and because attaching their wagon to Donald Trump uh, means continuing to lose.